my name is Andre Kish from Fink, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, GT for Gemstone. So this is the support that we have within GT for connecting and working with Gemstone databases. As you've heard before, Gemstone is an object-oriented, more or less, database that can scale and do par com parallel computation to a large degree. So I do not have any slides, so if you ask me for the slides, I just have this one. The rest of the <laughs> the rest of the talk is going to be a demo, and hopefully the demo gods are with me, and everything is going to go well. So this is how, if you enable the Gemstone integration, this is how GT is going to look like initially. So we have some generic cards, and then we have a session widget. So this is the main widget for interacting with Gemstone. The Gemstone has various kind of connectors, so here I have two connectors, so if I double click, it's going to create me a session and connect to this. If we want, we can also, for example, inspect just to see a bit more, so then we get an object, we call it a session registry. We can see that I have a session. This session has a connector that has some properties that we can edit. We can add new connectors and then use them to connect to actual sessions or change properties. And once we've connected, for example, if I come here and I double click, I'm going to get a playground. And in that playground, I'm going to get a gemstone snippet that can execute code within that gemstone session. So if I double click, now I have here a gemstone session. And this is connected now to this session. This is what's correct. I can change the name, but this is the session on this connector one. So I can do one plus one. Maybe, and then this is two, and this is something that comes from Gemstone now. But for this, the point of this the demo, let's use a bit more complicated example. And the ones that we're going to use is a set of GPS trajectories. So this was collected by Microsoft Research Asia, and it contains the tracking data that 80, 182 users donated, more or less, while using their phones. I already imported this into Gemstone, so this is a wiki page that we have that we can go through and more or less download and import this data set. It takes a while, but not that long, but I did it before, and only for the first 25 users. We don't need all of them for this. So if I go back, here I was in the page. Now I could say, so I stored them in the database, so I could do GT. This is just how I named the class, Geo, and I forgot the, ah. Or M, I think, Geo, Geo Life, and, and of course I should see what I type. Maybe I can copy typing, it's a bit more difficult. So now this is, I have a, I store them somewhere in some instance variable somewhere, so now we can execute this code and we get back the instance, the object that we have in Gemstone that contains this data. So this is an object of a GT RM GeoLife that contains 25 users, and we have, of course, the raw view of how it's implemented, and we have some views that show some information about this Gemstone object. We can see the users, for example, these are the 25, and if I'm interested in one, I could click, and then I get to that user. In this case, the users don't have names, it's all anonymized, we just have an ID and uh, their data. So this has 48 trajectories and 36,000 GPS data points, for example. And if we look here, you notice that we have two kind of tabs at the top. Within GT, whenever you in open an object in a new pane, you don't get an inspector. We ask the object, what tools should we use to display the object here? And normally, a normal a standard object will just say, please use the standard object inspector. But in this case, this is a proxy, so it will say, use, please, two tools. One is an inspector that shows you the remote side of the object. So here we're looking, for example, as a user, and this raw, is this the object on the remote side? But then we also have the proxy side, which shows you the concrete proxy object that resides locally in the GT image. Because we create an instance of a proxy object, and we use that to connect to the gemstone object. So in this case, you can inspect both. The object has two tools, two inspector tools in this case, and you can at any time switch between these two representations, depending on which level you want to do. It's all there, just you can switch depending on yeah, what you're interested in. And then often, in the context of an object, we want to execute code, maybe, right? They interact with that object. So for that, we have the playground at the bottom that we expand. So I already populated it with some code just to avoid the typing. 
So in this case, I have, I'm on the remote side, so I'm looking at the, how the object looks within Gemstone, and now I have a playground with snippets that by default are connected to the same Gemstone session within the object, which, within which this object resides. So now if I'm going to execute this code, it's going to be executed in Gemstone itself being bound to the current object. So in this case, we just get all users that have more than 20 trajectories. So I will execute, and now if we switch to users, yeah, there are just 14 users that have more than 20 trajectories. Interestingly, just to show you, I can switch also to the proxy side. So now, I can open an inspector, and by default, there is don't see any gemstone here. So this is a normal inspector that runs Faro code locally in the context of the proxy. So if I execute here, for example, self-users, I will get back a proxy object. And then to this proxy object, I can send back another message. So here, for example, we don't take the entire code and send it to Gemstone. We execute all the message sent locally, and if you get a proxy, we can send another message to a proxy, another message to a proxy, so you can chain proxy calls. So you can choose. Either you send the whole code in Gemstone to be executed, or you can execute it by chunks, if that's what you want. Also by just sending messages to, to actual proxy objects. So now let's go back to the remote side, and let's find a trajectory. And you notice that here we have views. I need a trajectory. Let's choose, I don't know, maybe this trajectory. So we have a view for this object. It shows the records. And we have another view, which uh, I guess internet, uh, OK. It was a problem with the internet, which shows this is a short one. Maybe let's find a bigger one that works. OK, this one works. So now we are looking at a gemstone object. And this is a trajectory. So it's a set of points through which the user was. We have the first view that just shows the set of points. We have another view that just shows, in this case, a representation. And there is another view that shows it on an open street map, how this looks like. And these views are created quite differently. So if we choose this view, and if we alt-click on it, we can go to its source code. And now we can see that this view, so here I'm looking at the gemstone proxy object or method. So this view resides within gemstone and it has this source code. So this view was created by executing this code in Gemstone, returning the specification of the view, and then using that to create a view locally. However, we don't have OpenStreetMap in Gemstone, or the ability to render. So if we look at the implementation of this view, we will see that it's not a proxy. So we see a normal object here. We don't have the two sides. So this view was defined locally on the class of the proxy object. And just to show you more here in the proxy, I could switch, and we'll have to look at this object. And I'll look at its local side. And if we go in the meta, we can see that this is a class that subclasses, subclasses our proxy object, says it's available for these objects, and defines the view we looked at before. So every time we create a proxy or instance of a proxy object, we can choose the type of the proxy object. So then. You can have specific types of proxies that define views that are specific for those objects, but they define them locally, not necessarily remotely. So this can be useful if you want to have like here more complex user interfaces. And if that's not available in Gemstone, you can still attach the view to the object using this mechanism. And this means we can have very as all lots of other types of views. So if I select a record, for example. I switch here, we can also show it if internet works on Google Maps, why not? So with the web view, we can embed the Google Maps, that's exactly at the, at the location, and this is done by adding a view locally to an object that resides within Gemstone. So if that's, again, this is not added, the view is created locally instead, not in Gemstone. And if we go back one step, uh, I want to reach a trajectory, so here. Now that we have a trajectory, like one very popular way of developing within Gemstone is to develop locally within Glamorous Toolkit and then deploy the code once it's done within Gemstone. Other cases are maybe you want to develop directly in Gemstone, but the one that GT for Gemstone supports more is the use case where you actually develop within GT and then deploy the code in Gemstone. And if this is the case, for example, this class here 
I will also load this code in GT. So now this class here is also present in GT. So if it is, I am able to open the local version of this class. So now this here is the class as it looks like in GT. And if I go here to the meta, here I'm going to get a coder, so showing the same code, but this coder is on the code that resides within Gemstone. So here I can edit the code in Gemstone, or here I can open the class locally and work with the code locally here. And just to show you maybe how this could look like, so let's say I want to edit this method here. I don't like that I have here this. I want to remove the parentheses. Now I'm going to save this, and this, when it's going to be saved, will be saved within the Gemstone database. So if I save, and I go back to the method here, it didn't change, because right now I just changed the code within Gemstone. The local version is still the same. But in this case, I could say I want to inspect from Gemstone. I want, and this will open me the same proxy, and now I have a diff view that shows me the difference between, for example, the local version and the Gemstone version of the method. You can always diff the two if you're... Locally, you want to say, show me the source code of this method as it looks like within Gemstone. And in this case, let's say I'm not happy with this implementation, it was bad, I could always say I want to keep one of it. Maybe I want to bring back the method from Gemstone locally, because I like it, or the other way, I want to compile this method within Gemstone. In this case, let's say that I like this, so I want to bring back this method from Gemstone. So now this code is the same as the one that was in Gemstone. So this is the way we approach this code editing. It's still just at the class level, at the method level here. This is missing for now, for example, the information about the class, the superclass, and other things, but those will be coming. And since we have the class, here I was just browsing the actual, um, uh, the actual class, local class. But we also have, using Stone, it doesn't work if the data is too big, but we can use Stone to just serialize the object and bring it locally. If that's what you want, you have an object in the database and you want to say, please bring me a copy locally because I want to work with it. I could click the download. And now if we click the download, what we are going to get is just a copy of this object. So it has, but I don't know what, there is a bug somewhere in this. <laughs> Let's see this work. Yeah, this sometimes the open stream map fails when the path is too big. But in this case, for example, I have the same view. And one is a remote object and the other is a copy. And the interesting thing in this case is that if I alt click on the local one, I have this source code and this is going to be identical to the one of the remote. So you can define a view locally and then you can also use it within Gemstone. So let's just try this just as an example because maybe it's a bit more abstract. So I'm going to go to a trajectory. Uh, let's see if I find user trajectory. Ah, did I already add this view? I don't think I meant to add this view. Let's uh, remove this view. Uh, what this is? No, I wanted to go to a user. Perfect. Here, this is what I wanted to show. So now I have a user object. The user has trajectories. Uh, let's bring back the other view because I didn't want to remove it. I removed the wrong one. So now this has records, but for example, I would like now to add to this user object a view that shows me the records from all trajectories. So it just goes through all trajectories, collects all the records, and shows me one view with all the records from all trajectories, instead of just, so now I have to go here, here, let's say what I want is just to have a records view at the level of the user, showing me all of this. There are more ways, let's just do it locally first. So I can go to the local, or I can just if I want to download this, a copy of this user locally. Hope I didn't choose a one that's too big. No, it's good. Now I can go to the meta side, and I already created this view, so I don't have to type that much. So in this case, it's just a normal inspector view. It says I want a column list, show put the records as the title, the priority to control the order, and then I want to display all records, so there is a method that knows how to return all the records of this user. And I want it to have three columns, let's say timestamp, latitude, and longitude. Now I can save this method, and if I will inspect the object, I have here this records view. At this point, this view is just available locally. But I can go here, and I will compile it, let's say, to Gemstone. 
And now if I go back and re-inspect the object that represents the proxy, I'm going to have my records view, which is the same I created locally. So I defined the view once, I could test it locally, and then I could deploy the same code remotely and get exactly the same view to look at the ob that type of object. Okay, but now one um, part that can be repetitive is this one that I kept doing here. So I was, maybe I was in the local side, I modified this view, then I had to manually accept the change and bring that change to Gemstone. Well, if you want to modify lots of code and always doing that is not necessarily the easiest way. Another way we can do is, for example, with the, you can commit into a repository and load the code into Gemstone, but then maybe you have to do lots of commits to get the code. So this we actually did for some clients. They were using this with their test databases. So they wanted to program more live against the test database. So if I inspect, for example, a session here, and I look at the status, you will see it has, for example, code sync and also auto commit. So it's possible to enable a setting at the level of the session so that it replicates all your changes also in the Gemstone database automatically as you are doing them. You don't have to do anything. It's like you do code locally, and changes get replicated to Gemstone databases. In this case, they only use it in testing database, not in production. So I could go to code sync, and I will say I want to start code sync. And you can configure lots of things like how, what kind of changes to do, just class changes, uh, instance changes, migration, and many other things. But let's see if this works. It should work. Let's see that I have my view here, and I said lat and long, and I would like to change this to be latitude and longitude it looks better. So I could go to my local version of this. Now I could go and look at um, records, and let's say I say la latitude, and now longitude. And now I save. Now this change, okay, I should not make a typo, latitude. Now I save, now this change has been replicated to Gemstone, and now if I will inspect this, hopefully, we see latitude and longitude. And if we look at the meta, the records now says latitude and longitude. So I didn't have to do anything. So it can be more transparent to program and lo locally and have your changes be automatically replicated somewhere else, in this case, in a Gemstone database. If we go back to the very beginning now, to the initial playground, let's spend more time and look at what we can do here. So for now, all I did here was to, to inspect an object. However, maybe I want to play with this object more in the context of this playground. So I want to store it in a variable, because I should be able to do that. Now if I execute, I get back the same object, but this time data should point to it, or maybe let's call it data. And now I can create another gemstone snippet. And maybe I want to send some message to this, let's say data users. So now I am within a gender gemstone snippet, and I can execute and get back the users. So here, this because this is a proxy object, when we send this code, we also send back the mappings, the correct, oops, the object identity, so we know that when we execute this context in Gemstone, data should be bound to the correct object there. However, I can also cre create a Faro snippet, and the same code is going to work. For example, I can do this, and, but the difference is now, before I, we are sending the entire code in Gemstone and executing it by setting the right bindings, in this case, what I can actually do, what we are doing is that we have a proxy and we're sending to this proxy the same, the message users, and in this case, we're going to get back the same, uh, the same, uh, the same object. And we can also do a few other things. I will just copy, uh, I will just switch to another snippet where I prepared a bit so I don't have to type everything. So I have the same here. I have my data object, and then, we are, let's say we have an object, we have this GeoLife object containing our users and we want to create another object and move the users from one to the other or add them to two of them at the same time. So we have our data or GeoLife object containing the users. Now we are going to create a new one here. So I'm going to say I want to create a new GeoLife container and store it in new data. Of course, I will have to store it also in Gemstone somewhere to not be garbage collected later on, but now we just have a reference to it here. And now we can execute, for example, this code, which says take the in new data, send it the message at the user, and with some parameter. So and now, if we, so this will be the actual user. We can also, if we want, I don't know, maybe create before another variable that says user. We store it here, 
and now we pass the user to this one. So now we're going to execute, get the user, execute this code, and now if we inspect new data, it has exactly one user. So when we do remote calls, we can pass both receivers and values for parameters as we need to. And as it happens, it will also work if we are executing this code locally. So this is a Faro snippet. And in this case, they will have, we'll have one, two, three, four proxy calls that are going to happen. So we're going to send first the message users to data, then items to that result, then second to that, and then add users with the proxy that was returned. So if we execute this and inspect new data, we get two users. So it's possible within a playground to combine this Faro snippet with Gemstone snippet, get proxies and use them in whatever context you want, as you feel that it works better for you. You don't have to just all the, execute all the code in one place, in one snippet. You can split and play as you want. So for now, we were just within the inspector, but let's quickly also look at what happens when things go wrong. I will execute now again the code to get back the initial object. And now we have here a method that says user short distance with bug. So this is going to trigger an exception. And when we're executing this, we get back a debugger. And in this case, this shows me the execution stack as it happens on Gemstone. So this is the execution stack from Gemstone. So if we, we can browse, so this is very similar to the local GT debugger. Actually, the interface is almost identical. We can, again, if we're interested in a particular object, we can browse it and look at it and navigate further, if that's what we need to do. And then we can also edit code, resume, do actions like in a normal debugger. In this case, the bug is here. I added plus instead of minus. So let's say I will save this. Now I save the method. Now I can, for example, proceed. Or I could step over this just to see if it passes. And now it passed. And if I look at the result, so this will be the return value. I see that it seems correct, so I actually fixed the bug. If I want to see what happened on the GT side, I can always switch to GT. And this is actually the, what the execution was up to the point when we called into Gemstone. So at the point we see we were waiting on something. So we had an exception, we triggered this, and then we knew that we are stuck in Gemstone. So we can always switch between the two sides, the Faro side and then the Gemstone side. And then just to end, just on a more technical note about how are we implementing this user interface. So with GT for Gemstone, for some of our clients, we have a limitation in the sense that it has to work to inspect objects also on networks that are slower. So if you have a latency of one, ge one call to uh, the remote Gemstone between 100 milliseconds and half a second. So you can see you want to inspect, we use, gems, use GT for Gemstone to work with a remote Gemstone database where the latency is around 500 milliseconds per call. So it means if you do 10 calls to, the in to get the inspector, it will fail. You will wait 10 seconds. If you do 100, you will not be able to use it. So the way we approach that, so to see that, let's switch to the proxy side. And here, for example, we have something called the remote specification, which is just going to be a big JSON, bigger or smaller, depending on how big the object is. So what we're doing here is we're saying we have a remote model of the user interface in Gemstone that we are instantiating and then creating a specification and returning it locally. So if you want to think about it, it's like server-side rendering. So this means here we can get the entire structure of this inspector with views, actions, title in one gemstone call. So it doesn't matter how slow, how many views you have for your object, it will always be one call. And this is what we do for the, for example, here. It's one call for the debugger is one. So we try to reduce the number of calls to make it possible to have it working reasonably well also on networks that are slower. Yeah, that's what I wanted to show you today. If you want to try it, you can just download your toolkit. All the code for the client is here, and if you, yeah, you need to install the GT for Gemstone within your Gemstone database. Currently, the installation process might be a bit tricky because different people use Gemstone in different ways. We have a few ways, but if you want to try it, maybe ping us and we'll see how you can simplify the installation instructions. Yeah, thank you very much. In my experience, the, 
the workflow that, that the Glamorous Toolkit proposes is, is pretty useful for, let's say, non-developers. I, I teach to people who comes from, I don't know, library sciences, uh, information sciences, journalism. And, and this, kind of, this kind of workflow works pretty well for, for them. Um, how do you see the, let's say, adoption uh, of multiple development into, into the development community? Because I think, at least is my experience with, with other people that, that is in Colombia and is used to using their tools like VS Code or, or even the class browser, like, like there is some kind of fixedness with the, with the previous tool and the previous toolkit and the previous way of, of, of workflow. How do you see this kind of, an of, of adoption? And in the line of, of reducing the, let's say, impedance and, and facilitating adoption, I was trying to use the, the web view. And in my case, it didn't work in, in Linux because external dependencies and whatever. So how are you tr trying to deal with the, yeah, with the external uh, dependencies, particularly in the Linux context? Yes. So now with uh, Linux, it still doesn't work yet because yeah, we have to support for now also Linux 20.04 because of reasons. And then for the web view, we need 22.04. It doesn't work, at least for Ubuntu. So more or less, that's what we're going to support and hopefully quite soon. And then for the first one, yeah, we did quite some, for example, we had also projects with companies where Java or JavaScript developers were learning to use the toolkit. And what we noticed is that in two to one month, if we were helping them or coaching them, they were getting comfortable. So it, there is a, it's not like the second day you'll be able to switch from Visual Studio Code to Glamorous Toolkit, but in our experience between two weeks and one month, if somebody so really wants to switch, it's not any problem. Uh, the uh, J JT Cooted runs in Faro, and uh, and but uh, but if you look at the Gemstone side, they have their own code repository. Would it be uh, um, complicated uh, or possible to? to make something like uh, the website pro uh, uh, talk yesterday that to look into uh, with a small client into other small talks and use uh, uh, the GG Cooled as a, a remote development? Yes. So for example, at some other company they are using like they have their system is in Gemstone. So they're using the web view in GT to look at the server and the application that runs within Gemstone. So in that case, it's so how, how big is the, uh, the, the code for, to, for the remote uh, Gemstone uh, uh, cl uh, server client or, or uh, site? Yeah. For, our, for GT for Gemstone? Yeah. It's not that big. I don't know the number, but maybe 100 classes or so. Mm -hmm. And it has very little, so it's mostly standalone. We try to reduce a lot. The, we don't overwrite any, any, so we adjust extension methods to some base classes. We have no override, we don't override any method that exists in Gemstone, so you can more or less load it cleanly. And we have no state that needs to be persisted. So in that sense, you yeah, you, you can just discard after your the session. Yeah. Thank you very much.